Vision Edge gives you less eye strain and reduced damage caused by blue light. We like to call Vision Edge sunscreen for the eye. It all starts with your highest level of visual performance, only achievable through scientifically proven Vision Edge. Hello and welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gelb, the host of the documentary Open Your Eyes. Please visit the film's website at openyoureyes2020.com, featuring interviews with more than 50 optometrists from around the country, sharing information on eye care and eye disease. If you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to get notifications of great new interviews. Also, please leave comments. Water, so beautiful to look at, feels great, and the sound is meditative. 99% of our body's molecules are made of water, but how much do we really know about water? Today's guest, Washington University professor, Dr. Gerald Pollack, PhD, has dedicated his life to the study of water. His best-selling book, The Fourth Phase of Water, takes us on a fantastic journey through how the mystery of water and answering questions such as, how do clouds made up of dense water droplets manage to float in the sky? Dr. Pollock, thank you for joining me today. Well, my, my pleasure, Kerry. I'm very happy to be with you. And just one minor correction. Uh, it's not Washington University, it's the University of Washington. And I know the two sound identical, but one is in St. Louis and the other one is where I live in Seattle. So uh, just to clarify, in fact, there are probably a dozen universities or, or more with the name Washington. Um, and you get confused. There's uh, George Washington University. There's Washington State University, our University of Washington, uh, Washington University, uh, Western Washington University, Eastern Washington University, et cetera. So sorry for the confusion. We're the oh. University of Washington. I apologize for that, but thank you for clarifying it. Now, oh, listen, it's fine. To be, to be healthy, we have to drink water. I mean, everybody has to drink water. To Now doctors are recommending before you start a diet, water becomes a part of weight loss and health. Why don't we know more about water? <laughs> that's a good question. Excuse me. <laughs> I hope that's water. It's water, uh, yeah, it's, it's water. Um, I hope that's the fourth phase of water. Well, I, I may have some fourth phase water in, inside, I think, but uh, that's another subject. But your question's a good one. Uh, why, why do we know so little about water? And, uh, you know, it used to be scientifically that water was a, a central topic of interest because people understood that uh, you know, that water was critically important for so, so much of nature and health and life. But uh, then something happened. Uh, there were a couple of debacles of that that took place and people became, scientists became scared, uh, literally scared of, of uh, dipping their foot into water. Um, and and um, there, there were two incidents, and uh, I'll just tell you briefly, uh, the, these two incidents really made the difference. And the first one uh, came forth by a guy named Boris Deryagin. And Deryagin was a Russian scientist, a physical chemist, and he was, uh, he was kind of considered the, the, the dean of Russian physical chemistry. Everybody looked up to him. And someone, someone came to his, his laboratory and um, and began demonstrating some odd features of water, which he then picked up and started, started researching. And he found that um, if he took a thin capillary uh, tube, you know, millimeter or so in, in diameter, uh, and he evaporated water so that uh, the conden condensate was pure, you know, nothing because it's evaporated water that's recondensed. He found something weird. He found that the water inside that tube was didn't behave like uh, this kind of uh, water here. That the boiling point uh, was very high, and the freezing point was very low. 
uh, and the density was higher than water, and a few, a few other features that simply didn't, didn't agree. And at first that remained in Russia, but then uh, it was the time of the Cold War, and, uh, and the Americans and British and such thought it, was, it would be beneficial for them to translate all of this Russian stuff. And so they did translate, and, and you know, suddenly there came the idea from a Russian group uh, that there was a different kind of water uh, beyond what we, what we know about uh, uh, liquid water. And of course, this got the attention of a lot of people. And because it was the time of the Cold War, uh, uh, you know, we were we were taught, we got the propaganda that that the Russians were totally and completely incompetent in everything that that they did. And so the, the first reaction was, well, we got to demonstrate the scientific community that is needs to demonstrate that this is nonsense. But of course. Other scientists thought, well, you know, this is pretty interesting. So there was a kind of dichotomy and who is going to pursue this interesting uh, kind of water and what shall we conclude? And so, so at first um, uh, there were some scientists who thought this was exciting and they published a paper in, in uh, the journal Science, which is, as you know, one of the most prominent journals. And in the paper, they said, basically, this is pretty interesting stuff and uh, we're going to call it poly water. Why poly water? Well, this water behaves not as a bunch of independent molecules, but like a polymer where all the molecules are, are linked together, you see. And so they call it poly water. And, and, um, and this was exciting for a number of people, but uh, uh, other, others found that this was nonsense, that it didn't make sense, that it was the result of contamination, you see. And, and because of that, it became controversial. And some people even thought that uh, because this is acting, if it's true and real, uh, it acts like a polymer. And if you take just a little bit of it and dump it into the ocean, the entire ocean will polymerize and life will vanish from the face of the earth. <laughs> so. Uh, you know, it entered into yellow journalism. And so, so it became a big deal. And, uh, and finally, um, uh, th there, was, there was a group, I think it was an Australian group, uh, who, who put some salt in the water and they found pretty much the same results as the Russians found. And so they concluded that, well, the Russians must have been sweating into their water and that must have been what produced their, their results. So, so it was a big embarrassment for uh, uh, for the Russians, and and two or three years later, the the, the uh, Boris Deryagin himself kind of uh, put the nails in the coffin of of poly water uh, by publishing a paper saying we were wrong, all the critics are right, um, and and that was the end of uh, of of poly water. It was a disgrace um, for for Deryagin. Uh, but the truth is, uh, if, if, if I may, a little bit different, or at least the truth that I learned, I learned this from uh, two uh, colleagues, um, close colleagues of Deryagin. Uh, one was a guy who lived in the same apartment complex, and they would have uh, coffee, vodka, three, four times a week and, and discuss. And he told me, uh, he said, this, this guy is a director of a uh, famous institute, a high, high level guy. He said, he said, until the day that Der Yagen died, he was sure that he was right. I said, well, why, why did he publish that paper? He was pressured by the Russian government. And so he was the one who was forced to take the blame, not the Russian government. And that protected the reputation of Russian science. And I heard exactly the same thing from someone who was one of the last postdoctoral fellows in Der Yagen's lab. She told me exactly the same. Until the day he died, he was sure he was right about this. So, so but you can imagine, you can imagine what happened after that, uh, that scientists shied away from studying water because it became really controversial. And if, if someone is distinguished as Boris Deryagin, uh, who is still remembered for his contributions, 
if someone, I'm sorry for that ringing, but uh, if someone uh, 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 like that uh, can be basically thrown off, um, um, then what about mere mortals like us? Uh, you know, we make, we, we may publish something and, and, and it will be demonstrated that everything we do is, is wrong. So, so a lot of the scientists who had formerly had real interest in water, they began staying away. And so research in the field of water uh, became something you just didn't do. You know, you could go in, into genomics or uh, various kinds of medical science or whatever, but stay away from water. See, it's dangerous. So that was, that was the first. And then there was a second uh, uh, one. And um, it, the, the protagonist in this case, with the same result, the protagonist here uh, uh, was Jacques Benveniste. This was in the, around late 80s or 1990. And, and Jacques was uh, just like Deryagin, uh, the French equivalent. He was a distinguished scientist in the field of immunology. And he was doing experiments, and in those experiments, uh, uh, um, he he would he would take some antibodies, and deposit those antibodies on particular cells, and the cells would respond by secreting uh, some some hormone. I I I forget which one it is, but it, it's not so important. Um, someone came to his laboratory and said, you know, I can do the same experiment as you with the same results, but I can do it not with those antibodies, but with those antibodies that are diluted and diluted, diluted and diluted to such an extent, like homeopathy, diluted to such an extent that, you know, essentially there are no molecules left. There's just water. Water that apparently has a memory um, or information uh, from the original substance, from the antibodies that were dissolved there because the reaction was so specific that the water had to have some kind of information. And at first he didn't believe the guy who came to his laboratory to show him that, but he had a laboratory of 50 people. You know, this was a really distinguished guy. Said, oh, okay, you know, there's a corner in the laboratory, it's empty, go do your thing. And before long, everybody in the lab was looking over his shoulder to see, and and what he what he was doing seemed uh, uh, to be confirmed, uh, and they were all shocked. But of course, being an intellectual and a, a guy with with curiosity and um, some drive as well, uh, in addition to some charm, especially with the women, I understand. <laughs> but that's another 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 story that I could tell you about if we have a moment. Uh, but but. Uh, and anyway, uh, he decided this is really important, so we're going to publish it. Well, it didn't work, or it did work in a sense. Um, so um, he he uh, he submitted um, a paper to the journal Nature, uh, saying, uh, uh, titling it something about water has memory, uh, and it was received by the editor of of, of Nature, and the editor of Nature, uh, John Maddox who became Sir, the late Sir John Maddox, said uh, essentially, this is bullshit. <laughs> you know, this, this, is, this, is, this can't be because if it's really true, then everybody else is wrong. And I refuse to believe that everybody else is wrong. So, so I wrote back uh, to Jacques, uh, who was a, a friend of mine. Uh, and and uh, he said, well, we're not gonna publish this because blah, blah, blah. Uh, having a whole bunch of spunk and realizing that he was right because he could, you know, this was a clearly an objective result that he got. So he decided, what am I going to do? So he recruited people from different laboratories around the world. Please repeat my experiment. And they repeated the experiment and they all got the same result. And so they decided to publish together. Uh, a bunch of independent scientists, and you know, if you were if you were the editor of Nature, and you, you've got a half dozen scientists who are submitting and reporting the same thing in their respective laboratories, I, I guess you you think, well, maybe there's something to it. But again, same 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 result. Uh, and finally, um, uh, well, almost finally. So 
so Jacques Benvenis was in, in, uh, in Paris and some of the homeopaths in, in, in Paris got wind of all this stuff and were saying, well, you know, this is a distinguished scientist. How could you simply throw out his results and say, it can't be, you know, this is a hero of ours. He's demonstrating that what we do in homeopathy is actually correct. So, so um, uh, Maddox, under pressure across the English Channel in London, uh, decided to strike a deal. And the deal, um, and this became famous, <laughs> the deal was, I'll publish, I'll publish your paper next week in the next edition of Nature, but we're gonna send a, uh, if you agree, we're gonna send a committee of peers to Paris to look over your shoulder and report back to our readers what we, we concluded. So, so Jacques agreed. I mean, he knew he had something there. And they, oh, gee, you know, you're going to send a bunch of peers, peers to look over my shoulder and see. It's no problem at all. So they came and they published the paper uh, with a kind of disclaimer saying, well, we're not really sure about this. Uh, and we'll get, uh, we're going to send a, a committee of people. We'll get back to you in a few weeks. Uh, so they came and, and, and the committee of so-called peers consisted of three people, and one of them was Maddox himself, uh, who had an ax to grind, you might say. Uh, another, another one uh, was uh, the, uh, the amazing Randy, um, that's James Randy, a magician. Uh, and so you can imagine sending a magician because they, they presumed it must be a trick, and, and, and this guy was, um, distinguished in his ability to figure out the tricks of other magicians. Um, and also, you know, he became, he became famous for challenging unconventional results and they're still doing that. Uh, and then the third one was a guy named Walter Stewart from the National Institute of Health specializing in scientific fraud. So they came, they observed, and uh, the first experiment done by a technician showed exactly what they had reported. The second one, uh, where some of the results were, were uh, um, uh, show, uh, well, it, the detail is not, not important, but the third experiment, finally, that was done by, um, it, with the hands of this, this guy, uh, uh, Stuart, uh, 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 didn't get, didn't show uh, the, the right results. And, and so they huddled in their hotel and they decided, well, when the French people did it, it worked, so to speak. When we did it, it didn't work. N equals one. Uh, so they went back home and they reported, oh, these guys are sloppy. And when we did it, it didn't work. When they did it, it worked. There's some kind of trick, but even parenthetically, the world's uh, greatest magician uh, couldn't figure out the trick. Uh, and and so, so anyway, uh, this was the second one that where water became the center of a, um, some kind of a controversy where, where Jacques Benveniste basically lost his career um, because it became a scientific joke. Um, oh, you're having trouble, you know, remembering things? Uh, just drink some of the Benveniste water. You know, it improves memory. <laughs> water contains memory. Well, I got to tell you that since then, uh, many people have repeated the Benvenist experiment and confirmed this result. So um, although the result is clear and true, you know, we, we organize um, each year uh, a conference on the physics, chemistry, and biology of water. Not this year, uh, because of obvious reasons. Um, uh, but uh, the people there at, at the conference are now about 200 people. Pretty much everybody at the conference understands that this is a fact that uh, the water has uh, can store information, has has memory, as pioneered by Jacques Benvenu. So anyway, I'm sorry for the long story, but you asked the question and I give you the answer. And the reason that a lot of people are not studying water uh, is in part because of those two debacles that took place where among the world's most distinguished scientists, they apparently screwed up. And if those distinguished scientists can screw up, what about mere mortals like the rest of us?
you know, <laughs> it's too dangerous. So, so let's, let's study genomics, um, you know, uh, or study climate change or, or whatever, instead of studying water. So water, water became um, uh, uh, a, a subject that people don't bother with. Um, on the other hand, you know, for me, uh, um, uh, knowing something about these, these two debacles and understanding from my predecessors that there were some really interesting things going on in, in, in water, things that when I began studying, I couldn't imagine. Uh, but that's how, anyway, that's how we got started. That's why the field of water is almost non-existent. There are some scattered people who do meet uh, annually or biannually, I forget. And they mostly do computer simulations. Um, and, and, um, but uh, apart from those people, uh, there's not much going on, um, but it's picking up in the past maybe half dozen years or so. A lot more people are becoming interested in because there's because water, it turns out, to be absolutely central to all of life uh, in, in a really interesting way. Yeah, I okay. maybe because of this, the, bit, the whole business of water with, uh, with water filters and the business practices are kind of on the fringe with multi-level marketing for some of these filters. So I think people have been able to use water People know it's important, but because of that, it really isn't well understood. And if we go back to Gilbert Ling, who talked about first structured water, and I think helped you with your hypothesis and Absolutely. Discovering, discovering the gel part of the water. Can you give us a little background of what Gilbert Ling had right when he came to structured water? Uh, yeah, he, uh, he had it right um, um, that so, so what is structured uh, water? Well, everything has structure. So structured water is kind of um, maybe a, a, a kind of vague term to describe it, but here's what, what he meant. Uh, so when we think of liquid water, uh, like the water that's inside here, the molecules are randomly oriented, uh, no, no order, and they're bouncing around uh, at a, a fierce number of times per second or even per femtosecond. Um, that's ordinary liquid water at, as best as we know it. And I got to tell you that we don't really know liquid water as well as most people think. There are, um, in, in my fourth phase uh, book, I, I discuss a half dozen different hypotheses and they're almost mutually exclusive for one another. So we don't really understand it. But what Gilbert was talking about is he said, this kind of water is interesting, you can drink it, but it's not what exists in the cell. In the cell, the molecules are not randomly oriented. They're not bouncing around. They're actually organized, structured, like, you know, like a column of soldiers standing at ease, for example, or maybe even at attention. Uh, he said the water inside the cell is like that. And he was able to adduce uh, 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 ample evidence to demonstrate that that's correct. And of course, you know, if it's correct, everything else is incorrect because the central assumption about what goes on <coughs> inside your cells and my cells and everybody else's cells is that the water is ordinary water and substances can diffuse through very easily and is not really important. Uh, the water is just like, you know, like a bathtub filled with water bathing the more important molecules of life, like proteins. DNA and, and, and such, but it's not really important. And if you look through any biology book, um, water, you know, uh, water may appear in the first chapter and then it's never mentioned again because it's considered to be unimportant. So Gilbert said, no, no, not true at all. And I think he was right about that. And what we learned, which goes something beyond Gilbert, um, and by the way, Gilbert just passed within the last year or so, reaching almost reaching 100 years old. Uh, so I, I believe he's right about that, um, but there's more that, that goes beyond uh, Ling. And there's one other thing, uh, one other way that he influenced me. He was kind of a mentor to me, although uh, 
we didn't sit in the same laboratory or anything, but I was so inspired by, by his work. A another was um, uh, the pumps that are supposed to be located in the cell membrane. And um, the first one that was discovered maybe 40 years ago or more, Nobel Prize, of course, was the sodium pump. And he was skeptical and he did some experiments. Um, uh, basically, he pulled the plug on the sodium pump by poisoning the cell in multiple ways to make sure that the cell uh, uh, couldn't, couldn't function or that essentially that the energy that was needed to power the sodium pump was not available at all. And yet still the consequence of sodium pumping still existed. For example, the electrical membrane potential, the separation of sodium and potassium, even though the pump wasn't working, you see. Um, and he demonstrated that. And although the number of pumps in the cell membrane has, has now um, amplified to something like a few thousand, uh, if, I, if I've got it right, uh, uh, on, that, on that order, there's no energy uh, available or not enough energy available to, to run those pumps. And I think Gilbert was absolutely right about his point, which has not been accepted, or most of what he has done has not been accepted by the scientific community. Um, <coughs> excuse me, but that's typical. We all know that even Einstein, you know, before he got his Nobel Prize, <coughs> many people were skeptical about his ideas of relativity and and other. It, it, I mean, it, it goes back to to Galileo and even Copernicus, who was burned at the stake. Scientists who espouse um, unconventional views are not treated kindly, and that is absolutely persistent to this day. And that's maybe a third area in which Gilbert. Um, influence me uh, because we've been deeply involved in trying to do something in, uh, about about this feature of, of science. And uh, if you ask me about it, I'll tell you, but maybe you want to get on to, to other stuff. I, <laughs> I, I'm leaving it to you to guide this conversation. Macular degeneration is a leading cause of vision loss, with 15% of Americans being at risk or already affected. Scientific evidence proves that by using mesozeaxanthin, lutein, and zeaxanthin together replenishes the macular pigment and promotes healthier vision. This formula comes in only one product, MacuHealth. Thank you for tuning in to the Open Your Eyes podcast. If you like the video you're watching, please hit the like button. Also hit subscribe for weekly new episodes of the podcast along with pod winks and bonus content. All right, let's get back to the show. So we know that the solid liquid and a vapor part of water. Right. You worked hard on your research with the gel part of water. Right. And that it's not H2O, but it's different. Now, if I cut myself and wear it, you know, we're at 80% water or 99% of our molecules of water. Shouldn't water be shooting up out of my arm? It should. That's exactly the point. Uh, Why doesn't yeah. it? You put your finger on it uh, or you put your finger on that leak. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so if it, if it were water, uh, liquid water, which you're drinking or maybe it's coffee. Um, yeah. I mean. Okay. I'm drinking structured water. Yeah. Yeah. Good Easy for you. Water. Okay, that's fine. What do you got at the bottom? Shungite? Uh, blueberries. Oh, blueberries. Good for you. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, if it's plain old liquid water, it should come, uh, if not shooting out, at least oozing out, but it doesn't. So it's gel-like. And um, so, you know, the question that comes from there is, well, gee, what, what does it mean to be gel-like? Well, you know, if you take, if you eat some, if, 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 you, if you have the, quote, pleasure, unquote, of eating jello for, for dessert, uh, you, you know that the water doesn't leak out, it stays in. Um, and, and the reason that it stays in, um, uh, I mean, you could, you could devise reasons you can, uh, uh, that it might stay in, like, for example, um, osmotic pressure holding it in, but there are reasons why that, that doesn't work. And the reason, the, the real reason why we've studied this, the reason uh, why a gel is a gel, why the water doesn't leak out, is that it's not ordinary liquid water. It's actually what we call fourth phase water, or what Gilbert would say structured uh, water. It sticks to the solids inside the cell, you see. 
this stuff adheres. In fact, it forms when there are solids. That's the way it actually does form. If you have a, a, a hydrophilic water loving surface and water is a buddy next to it, then this kind of structure we call fourth phase or easy uh, water for reasons I can tell you if you ask. Um, it's easy to remember. Easy to remember, right, you got it. But, but it's more than that. It stands for exclusion zone because this kind of water excludes solutes and particles. So, so when, when the stuff, when the water butts up against the surface, the structure begins to develop. The water gets transformed and it gets transformed one layer at a time. Each, each layer uh, having a honeycomb kind of structure. And so because the water adheres to the solids inside the cell, it doesn't come leaking out. So when you cut yourself, the water doesn't come pouring out. You, you may get some blood that comes out, but, but the blood itself is, is, is different, you see. Uh, but the stuff that's inside the cell and even some outside uh, is, is built of fourth phase water. Now this water, for this gel-like water helps give us energy, but we also need energy from the sun. Can you explain how the energy from light from the sun, along with the gel water, is able to produce energy within the cell through the mitochondria? Well, well, well. Okay, back up a step. I'm not suggesting that it must be through the mitochondria, uh, but that's another. Uh, but let me address the question more generally about the sun, and then we can, if you remind me, um, because I'll forget, I'll get back to mitochondria. Uh, if you like, it's the entire cell. The whole cell is filled with this stuff, uh, and the mitochondria, particularly, we we think uh, the mitochondria. But the cell is there's plenty of evidence for that, and and the key to all of this is that w without um, without energy, you can't build structure or order. So a good example of that I talk about in my fourth phase book is is the um, um, is is your office now your office is pretty clean pretty neat uh, but um, usually you know we throw paper here we leave a cup there it gets messy and it requires no energy to to uh, accrue that kind of mess but one day we decide you know I'm sick of this mess I want to clean it up on an order uh, re restore order you got to put some time and energy into that and so the the central theme which is known for many years in the field of ther thermodynamics is if you want to cr create order from chaos, you need to put in energy. Same principle is true for the water. If you want to create order, uh, easy fourth phase structure, from chaos, water molecules bouncing around randomly and such, you got to put in energy. So it took us a uh, it took us a few years to figure out where that energy might be coming from, and it was actually a student. Um, who inadvertently discovered the answer. Um, he took a, a chamber where we can usually see this kind of buildup of uh, easy fourth phase water. And he, sh he, he was a lamp sitting next to him, a gooseneck lamp, and he picked up the lamp and shined it on the chamber. And he called me in and he showed me that where, where the chamber was illuminated by the lamp, uh, the easy water grew in, in volume. You see, and they pulled it away and it, it receded back to its original. So it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that light was really important in this. So in other words, in order to build this kind of structure, you need to apply light. And we did formal experiments to find out which wavelength of light was, was most important. And we found that it was not the visible uh, range and it was not the ultraviolet, it was actually infrared. Okay, so you shine infrared light uh, on it and even a small amount of infrared light, like from a light emitting diode is sufficient to create a huge expansion of the volume, uh, if you will, of, of easy water. Uh, and then we get to the sun. So what about the sun? Well, you know, it's well known that of the sun's energy, more than half of the sun's energy that reaches the surface of the earth is in the infrared region. So it means that, means that the energy that's required for building this kind of water, uh, either in your cells or in the environment, it doesn't matter, uh, 
comes from basically, or could come from sunlight. It could also it come from your, your uh, so back for, for a moment, the sunlight, it's so the heat from the sun, we, the, sun uh, the sun produces light and heat, and the heat is essentially infrared energy. And, and, and so it's that heat infrared energy that uh, reaches our body, or that reaches a lake or the ocean or whatever that builds this kind of easy water. But in terms of you and me, um, you know, uh, we also, this heat comes from metabolism. Metabolism generates heat. And so, you know, general idea is, well, not only does it keep us at a, um, a warm temperature above, above the uh, 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 environment uh, temperature, but also it's supplying infrared energy and it's not just radiated out into the environment but it's actually used by the water that inside our body that absorbs it and converts the water that we would drink ordinarily to easy water for phase water see so so when you ask the question about the sun um essentially the sun is maybe a metaphor for any kind of infrared energy that could come from inside outside but what have you, ultimately from the sun. The sun's energy is what is, is inevitably responsible for building this kind of water. So we should thank the sun for that. Now, a lot of kids don't spend any time outside. And they're inside all day, they're looking at computers, they're very tired. Is that because they're not going out and getting infrared from the sun? and? Build, helping build the easy water to build to to maintain energy. Well, yeah, I mean it could be. Uh, uh, um, there are also some adults that don't go out too often in, sure. into the sun, but but need to, and and we know how important it is. But you know, there is there are people people in Scandinavia who um, there's not much sun in the winter time in in places north, even Seattle. You know, here it. It gets light at about uh, eight o'clock and gets dark at about four o'clock uh, at at this time of year. So we don't get so much sun. And when theoretically the sun ought to be out, there are clouds that block the sun in in the northwest where where I live. And so, and it's the same in Scandinavia. But the Scandinavians increasingly understand the um, importance of, of of sun, and so they go south for a while um, near the equator may spend a good deal of time there and then return when the weather gets a little bit better and the Scandinavians can afford it because um, they have an ec economic system that uh, ensures that m many people are doing re reasonably well. And, and so uh, that's what they do. So yeah, and another way to get this energy, to, I mean, what I'm getting to is this energy is really important um, for, uh, for building the easy water in our, in our body, um, you see, and, and there's another way to do it. You can, you can, and the Scandinavians do this, and the Russians, and immerse yourself in a sauna, or they say sauna, uh, because it's hot. And what does the heat do? Well, basically, uh, the heat is infrared energy, so you immerse yourself in the confines of a sauna for 20 minutes, and you're exposed to huge amounts of infrared energy. and since you're not wearing much clothing, um, anyway, the infrared permeates your 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 body um, and builds easy water. And because this easy water is critical for function, um, your cell needs to be filled with this stuff in order to function properly. That's why uh, often you you feel better when you come out than when you go in. Um, and you know it permeates every recess in 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 your body. So. It's a, uh, it's it's critically important. And does that mean that you're you're better off going in an infrared sauna rather than a, a, a traditional uh, finished sauna? Well, I, I don't know. I I'm no expert on that, but they do the same because um, if you go into an infrared sauna, um, you use a a special kind of uh, electrical uh, fixture that generates mostly infrared energy. Uh, and 
in a traditional sauna, you're, you're basically doing the same, except uh, the infrared energy, the heat, is coming not from a light bulb of some sort, but uh, in a more natural way. So I, I don't know wh which one is more effective. If, it, if it's just the energy alone, then it probably doesn't matter. Um, but the wavelength, the particular wavelength does matter, and you'd have to investigate. We found that a wavelength of three micrometers, 3.0, uh, is more effective than other infrared wavelengths. So I, I, I guess if, if I were to, to judge the efficacy of one versus another, I'd want to know, I'd want to measure to see which wavelengths are being generated. Um, but, you know, the question that I, I didn't really complete the answer to the question you asked, you know, where does the energy come from inside the cell? Or, and you asked particularly in the mitochondria, um, and, and the, reason, the reason that this water contains energy is because it contains electrical charge. So ordinary water is neutral uh, or close to, to neutral, but the fourth phase water is in general negatively charged. And so it means that your cells uh, filled with easy water will have negative charge. And the usual reason for uh, thinking about why the cell has, has why when you stick an electrode in the cell, you get a negative electrical potential, every cell in your body. It has to do, the, if you look in the textbook, with pumps and channels in the membrane. And, and as I mentioned earlier, Gilbert Ling dispelled the notion of membrane pumps. He, he demonstrated very clearly that it's wrong. And we argued that about the channels that um, not, not not in the book that you mentioned, the fourth phase of water, but the previous book, Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life, that also, that the channels did, didn't make any sense. Um, sorry to be so dogmatic about it, but the reasons are, are laid out uh, uh, there. And so, so I think the, that those two arguments about pumps and channels being responsible for the well-known negative electrical charge of the cell are wrong. And, the correct explanation, I believe, based on our evidence and simple logical arguments, is that it comes from the negative charge of the water that's inside the cell. Um, uh, and 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 so so you have a cell that's full of negatively charged water, right? And when you when you put a bunch of negative charges together and stuff them into um, a cell or a bag or anything, they want to they want to come apart from one another because they repel each other. And that's basically energy. That's potential energy that could then be released to do work. And so the water itself that's inside your cell actually contains potential energy. And, and that energy could be expended as, as, as work. Now, what fraction of that energy is, is the fraction that actually is used to do the work of the cell remains unclear. It's a, a a quantitative argument who, whose, whose answer is, remains uh, unknown at the moment, but it, it could be a very significant amount of the energy uh, that your cell expends do the work that it's designed to do. And, and that, that brings me also to, you know, some of your, your listeners may, may know that there are people who don't eat. Uh, and the question is, of course, is, well, where, where do they get their energy if they don't eat? And, you know, a lot of people think this is impossible. It, it must be a hoax of some sort. It can't be. But, but um, many people uh, um, can, are able to do that and prefer to do that. And, and there's, a, there's a, great, a great video, a movie by a guy named, a producer named Straubinger from Austria, and it's a documentary, and he interviews about, well, 15 or 20 different people who don't eat or, or don't eat for periods of time ranging from, you know, weeks to months to years. And they get on just fine uh, without eating, and they prefer to not eat. And so the question arises, well, you know, if you don't get your energy by plunging your teeth into a, a T-bone steak or something, well, you know, where does the energy come from? And um, a possibility is that the energy comes from the sun building this negative electrical potential inside your cell, which is then used to run uh, the energy 
or at least much of the energy that's required inside your body. So, okay, and then, right, go ahead. I was so gonna, now that we're talking about charges, that leads to what every eight-year-old asks their dad, why are the clouds in the sky? Why do they float up? <laughs> so you have to okay. answer that question. I had it in my intro. Okay, that's a great question. As I look out there, I see clouds in the sky. And um, okay, so so what's the reason for that? Uh, and um, uh, there are there are actually there are actually two two facts that you need to know that a lot of people don't know uh, that. Uh, can answer the question. Uh, the first fact is that the earth is negatively charged. Um, and I got to tell you, I, you know, I began my career in studying electrical engineering. Uh, that was my undergraduate uh, course. And, and um, no professor ever told me that the earth was anything but neutral, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and when when a Russian guy was working in my laboratory one day, Andrei Klimov, uh, he was just about to leave after six months in my lab and he was about to catch his flight and he started a conversation with me just before the taxi came. Uh, and and uh, he said uh, something about the Earth's electric field. I said to Andre, you know, having some background in you know, electrical kinds of things, I said, Andre, you must mean the magnetic field. Everybody knows about the magnetic field. I never heard of the Earth's electric field. He said, well, gee, uh, you know, it, in, in, in Russia, he said, every middle school student knows about the Earth's electrical field. Um, I said, I never heard of such a thing. You gotta be crazy, Andre. And he said, well, I guess there's some deficiency in the education in the US because you know, if every middle school student knows about this in Russia, there's gotta be something to it. So I went home that evening, um, uh, uh, couldn't sleep. Uh, uh, something, there's a kind of disconnect. How could it be that the earth really has a negative charge, not neutral? You know, you think when you plug into the wall, you got three prongs and the third prong is zero, neutral, connecting to a neutral earth. He said, well, the only, the only way, or I surmise the only way this could happen is if the earth is negative and somewhere up there in the ionosphere is positive. So you've got plus and minus, and if you've got plus and minus separated, you have an electric field. So next day, a student working in my lab, or rather a student student, brought me the evidence. And uh, a summary of the evidence appears in, in the, um, famous set of lectures by the legendary Nobel physicist Richard Feynman. And in his famous lectures that are read by almost every graduate student in physics in the US, volume two, chapter nine is a whole chapter on the evidence that the earth is negatively charged. So it's not a, just a conjecture. There's lots of evidence from 60, 70 to 100 years ago. And everybody knew that the earth was negative, negatively charged, but we've forgotten. So that's point number one, the earth is negatively charged. Point number two is that the little droplets uh, of water that make up the cloud are also negatively charged. And the evidence appears uh, in my book, the one you mentioned called the fourth phase of water. And, and, and so, um, you know, elementary physics says, gee, if the earth is negatively charged and if the cloud is negatively charged, you're gonna have a repulsive force. And because of the repulsive force, the cloud wants to stay away from the earth, or at least sometimes. There's, there's more to the story because obviously it does rain sometimes. But when you look at that white puffy cloud, that cumulus cloud that sits up there, and it looks like it's the abode of angels. Um, the reason it sits up there is because it's got negative charge and clouds with more negative charge would be higher and clouds with less negative charge would be lower. And if you could somehow reverse that charge, you get rain. Um, and a question that actually is, is never addressed by, uh, by the atmospheric scientists is, well, gee, it's another one of those, those conundrums. When it rains, um, how come it rains in little droplets instead of like the whole cloud coming down and pouring on your head? Uh, 
there's a question that people don't address, but obviously it's a really important question because you know, any understanding of weather needs to explain how this happens. Because you know, if you were able to take a ladder and climb the ladder with a cup of water like this up to the level of the cloud and you turned it on its side, it would come down in the bucket. But that's not what happens when it rains. So that's yet another question that needs to be answered. And by the way, you didn't ask, but my next book, uh, which is almost finished, um, uh, deals not only with 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 rain and electrical charges, but the role of electrical charge in so many phenomena that we kind of take for granted, but don't really understand, uh, like what turns the earth every 24 hours, uh, what creates atmospheric pressure, what's responsible for gravitation, how do birds fly, et cetera, et cetera. And they're all ad addressed in, in that book. And do we, have a, do we have a name? Uh, maybe you can suggest one I haven't been able to figure <laughs> out. We have a few candidates, but uh, I, I'm going to do a survey uh, with my favorite titles and see what, what people think. You know. So, so what's the bottom line? Why it doesn't the why doesn't it just pour right out? Why does it come down in droplets? Well, it, um, yeah, um, I'm hesitating for a moment because there there are a few steps uh, in in the argument, but just to kind of quickly summarize without producing evidence, at, you know, um, at the moment, is it actually starts as droplets. What happens is that that the evaporated water, much of the evaporating water evaporates as, as, as droplets. Um, and uh, you don't realize this, but, but you can convince yourself very quickly by going to Starbucks, ordering a, ordering a cup of hot coffee, sitting there, and then watching the vapor rise from the coffee, especially if you have a dark background and you can see the vapor rising. Um, in order to see vapor, uh, the constituent rising entities must be at least the same, as large as the wavelength of light. And the wavelength of light is, you know, roughly half a micrometer or something like that, depending on the particular wavelength. And so, so it means that whatever is evaporating from your cup, in order for you to see it, uh, needs to be at least a half micron. And typically people have measured it maybe 30, 40, 50 micrometers. It's a little droplet. Um, and of course, droplets can merge with one another to create even bigger uh, droplets. And so what's rising up during evaporation is not only, or as described in the textbook, single molecules, but also these, these uh, droplets, otherwise you wouldn't be able to see them. They're rising up and they come together to, to produce a cloud. Okay, so the cloud, the cloud itself consists of droplets. Um, and, um, and, and what, what a cloud is, is not um, liquid water exactly. It's actually a, a series of droplets that are held at a certain distance from one another. Um, that part's not unknown. Uh, it's known that um, the cloud consists of these little droplets, but what's not known is how this happens, how it occurs. And that's treated in my fourth phase of, uh, of water booklet, a book uh, to, to some extent. So it exists as droplets. And basically those droplets get pulled down. Um, the one that's nearest the earth um, gets pulled down first and another and another. And the mechanism by which this happens is it, 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 it's not complicated. It involves something called induction. Um, but I'm not sure whether, you know, going in, into detail is, is, is worthwhile at, at this point. Uh, no, just, but that, that's, that's, that, that's very helpful now. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean them both. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And 
most importantly, the reason why I buy safe for you is because it's safe for me and you.